Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel and uh, welcome to the sunny day. Uh, what a wonderful day. I, we were just in the fireside room and um, through that window, when you're only looking one direction, there is not a cloud to be seen. It is all blue sky. So um, hopefully that sun outside gives us a sunny disposition and that sun and sunshine in our hearts will share and glow out with other people. I know that we are few in number, it's a long weekend, but few in number doesn't mean less of God, and so that is always a wonderful thought. My opening words come to you from Isaiah 55, and I've chosen to read from the International Children's Version. Um, they have some wonderful translations, maybe not the perfect translation from Hebrew and Greek, but it feels like it's a good story. The Lord says, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. Those of you who do not have money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk. You don't need money. It will cost you nothing. Why spend your money on something that is not real food? Why work for something that doesn't really satisfy you? Listen closely to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the food that satisfies your soul. Come to me and listen. Listen to me so you may live. I will make an agreement with you that will last forever. I will give you the blessings I promised to David. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to stand, and if you would like to follow along with the music in your hymnal, it's song number 30 in the Voices Together hymnal, the Purple Book. And we have sung this song before. We've sung these words, but we've never sung this melody, so it's something new in terms of melody, but um, it's, it's a beautiful Scottish melody that comes from the Isle of Iona, a place near and dear to my heart. Jesus calls us. song number 420, 420, God of the Bible.
the bulletin. I was going through it this week, and um, every week there's something new and something different in there. So I hope you take time to look at it because it has quite an eclectic set of announcements. I went through again yesterday, and I was thinking, you know, June 4th, there's a workshop on at Emmanuel on our new hymnals. So there'll be some history to the new hymnals. There'll be some sharing, some singing. Uh, June 5th is Pentecost, and we're doing our installation service. June 9th is a congregational meeting. And then there are all sorts of activities you can join in. Yoga is prayer. You can go on a walk with um, thoughts of reconciliation with our Indigenous people. There is a Climate for Crisis webinar. So there's a lot happening. Uh, Make sure you take a look at those things and include them on your schedule and there are all sorts of things for our youth as well. So uh, please take heed. As we go into a time of prayer, I'd like to remind all of us that we have not reintroduced the offering in our process of worship during church. So just a reminder that as you leave, there are the offering baskets that are still set up at the back. Um, If you wish to contribute and donate, um, you can always do it online. You can drop it off in the office with Joel and he can direct it to the right persons. So there are ways to do that at this point. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Almighty God, from whom comes each good gift of life. We remember your loving kindness and your uncounted mercies as we join in grateful praise. For all your gifts to us and to our human race, for our life and the world in which we live. For the order and constancy of nature, for the beauty and bounty of the world. For day and night, summer and winter, seed time and harvest. For the very joys which every season brings. We give you thanks, O God, for the work we are enabled to do and the truth we are permitted to discover, for the good that has been in our past, and for all the hopes which lead us on toward better things, for all the joys and comforts of life, for homes and families, for our friends, for the love, sympathy, and goodwill of persons near and far. We give you thanks, O God, for all cultures, wise government, and just laws which order our common life for education and all the treasures of literature and science and art for the disciplines of life, for the tasks and trials which train us to know ourselves and which bring us to accept one another, or the desire and power to help others, for every opportunity of serving our generation in ways large or small, or the gift of Jesus Christ and everything which is ours as his disciples, and the presence of and inspiration of our Holy Spirit throughout our days. We give you thanks for all these things, O God. Amen. Today, the scripture is the story of the sower, and I decided I'd like to read from the message I think there are a few kids in the building here. Are there? Can you wave at me and let me know if there's kids in the... If you, are you a student going to school? Yay! There are a few. That's good. Because I'm using a version to tell you a story from the Bible. And Jesus was a great storyteller. And I've learned that, you know what? Kids like stories, but so do adults. And when Jesus was teaching, he used the story as a way to teach us a lesson. So um, if you want to put your listening ears on, and uh, for all of us that are kids at heart who love to hear stories, here is the story of the sower as um, written in the message. As they went from town to town, a lot of people joined in and traveled along. He addressed them using this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Some of it fell on the road. It was tramped down and the birds ate it. Other seed fell in the gravel. It sprouted, but withered away because it hadn't gotten really good roots. Other seed fell in with the weeds. The weeds grew with it and they strangled it out. Other seed fell in rich earth and they produced a bumper crop. And if you're not a farmer, a bumper crop is like, Lots more than they expected. Are you listening to this? Really listening? His disciples asked, Why did you tell us this story? 
He said, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. There are others who need stories, but even with some stories, they're still not getting it. Their eyes are open, but they don't see things. Their ears are open, and they don't hear things. This story is about some of those people. The seed is the word of God. The seeds on the road are those who hear the word, but no sooner do they hear it, and the devil snatches it away. So they don't believe and be saved. The seeds in the gravel, well, they're like those who hear with enthusiasm, but the enthusiasm doesn't go very far. It's only a fad, and the moment there's trouble, it's gone. And the seed that fell in the weeds, well, those are the ones who hear, but then the seed is crowded out, and nothing comes of it as they go about their lives worrying about tomorrow, making money, and having fun. But the seeds in the good earth, these are the good hearts who seize the word and hold on no matter what, sticking with it until there's a harvest. As we prepare to hear the message, we've chosen some songs that reflect the scripture story that we just heard. And this song comes to us from Manitoba, from Camps with Meaning. Uh, it's song number 789 in Voices Together, the purple hymnal that we just read from. And I invite you to stand if you're able and let's sing this song together. So Thanks, Thanks. 
little bit back in your hymnal to song number 777. So I guess this is the holiest song in the book because, you know, triple seven. <clears throat> seven being the holy number, apparently. This is a, another beautiful song that reflects our theme today. And if you get a chance at home, when you're home, look, Google this song, um, for those of you who like computers, and listen to a girl named Tom and their version of this. It's absolutely beautiful. We will not sing that version today. We will sing this beautiful version of this song today. So we'll sing it through three times so that it's very short. We'll sing it through three times so that you get the hang of it. you I kneel and we don't have kneeling pads on our pews so I'm going to invite you to be seated while we sing this song this is a prayerful beautiful song that will serve as a prayer before we hear Emmanuel give our message Yeah. 
Good morning. While preparing for this sermon, I was reminded of how it is difficult to change, but also of the necessity for change. My first audience for this sermon was my family, and my son took the the opportunity to be my English pronunciation teacher. So I was struggling to pronounce the word chapter, because in French it's chapter. So he would say, Daddy, it's not chapter, it's chapter. So I realized how much my jaw and my tongue were not in alignment with my brain. But I committed myself to to that change because I know it's going to make our experience here wonderful. So if that happened, please use your grace toward me. So this morning, I want to invite you also to change. Not the way you pronounce uh, English words, but to reassess the meaning of one of the most popular Test of the biblical narrative, the parable of the sower. We will argue that looking from a Christocentric perspective, meaning from the perspective of Jesus and from the perspective of Luke, the author that we are going to use, the parable of the sower is more about the faithfulness of a group of women, which makes them, make them Examples of the way the kingdom of God is displayed on earth as it is in heaven. As a result, they are the good soil. But first, let me explain why we use the account uh, of Luke. Luke has a broader audience. The first evidence to this assertion is often drawn from the account of the genealogy of Christ. While Matthew goes from Jesus to Abraham, the founder of the Hebrew, Luke extends his list to Adam, the father of humanity. The second evidence is also found Right at the start of the book, Luke addresses his message to Theophilus, a Roman official. And at the time, Rome were considered the hand of the world. We also use Luke account because women are given more prominent role in the account. Mark Strauss, in his book, Four portraits, one Jesus, state that there are 13 women mentioned in the Gospel of Luke that are not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. And some of them are subject of parables. Now, let's consider why Luke may have stressed the predominant role of women. So much has been said about the marginalized situation of women in first century Jewish Palestine. But from a Greek or Roman point of view, the fate of women was not much different to the Jewish counterpart, except that they were a little more emancipated. They enjoyed certain freedom, such as the right to, of property, business ownership, and independence from men. Thus, you might understand why it may seem crucial for Luke to respond in great length to an inquiry about the role women play in the life and ministry of Jesus. So we should also not neglect the role of the Holy Spirit inspiring Luke to emphasize the important role of women in the ministry of Jesus. Now, to understand the book, 
Now, if you look, you represent a global account of Jesus. And our church, Emmanuel Mennonite, is a Christocentric Anabaptist congregation with a global perspective. It is then practical to use his account of the parable of the sower. To understand the book of Luke, it is necessary to appreciate his purpose, his vision of the intention of the author, and the strategy of framework the author uses. Luke's purpose is very simple, to respond to a question of a new believer, Theophilus which are not overtly stated in the book, but one can draw what they are. Is the new faith only for Jewish people? Who is John the Baptist, and how does he relate to Jesus? What roles do women have in this new movement? Are they equal to men? Was Jesus really the Son of God, and the savior of the world? Did he have supernatural power? Did he really arise from the dead? So, to respond to this inquiry, Luke intended to provide a faithful account based on his research and testimony of eyewitness. If Luke was our contemporary, we would have said that he used an empirical method, a scientific method. Luke's strategy throughout the entire gospel was to present the inaugural ceremony of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, using the prophet Isaiah as framework to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favor favorable year of the Lord. Those four pillars are going to resonate toward the entire book, including story that Jesus are going to is going to tell. The parable of the sower happened in chapter for chapter 8, verse 4 to 16. But we would be missing the point, as so many did, if we read the parable detached from chapter 7, 36 to 8, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. In the last section of chapter 7, we are introduced to a woman with the, doctor, the, the author described living a sinful life. She hears that Jesus is in the neighborhood. She rushes to the house and kneels behind Jesus and sobs to the point that Jesus' feet become wet. She uses her hair, dries her feet, and I know Christ with her most important possession, her perfume, her perfume. Now, seeing that, the Pharisee, the man who invited Jesus, told to himself, if this man, if this man was really a prophet, he would have known who this woman woman uh, was. Sensing that Jesus used a story of long forgiveness in order to make a point. He stay, and at the end, he asks a question. Who do you think will love the master more? The man say, the one who has been forgiven more. And Jesus say, you did right. And Jesus, at the end, explain the difference between the man action and the woman action and conclude by saying, 
Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. So what Luke is doing here is to use, is to answer one of Theophilus' questions. The difference between men and women in the, the environment of the ministry of Christ. It contrasts men action and a woman action. And after, he makes a statement, the woman so right. The woman have saw the Christ, he responded the way the, we respond in the kingdom of God. Now, in chapter 8, the framework is similar, but instead of going individual to individual, Luke goes group to group. We are, to, we are told that Jesus went to village, uh, to city to village, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. The men, the twelve, were with him, but also a group of women. And Luke take great time to explain the situation and condition of those women and what happened as a result of the encounter with Jesus with Christ. They served the ministry of Christ with all their substance. All the passage or other translations say, we all they have. Like the women at, from 736 who all are with her tears, her hair, and her perfume, those women from chapter 8 to 3 serve with Christ with all their substance. Then, when people gather, Luke is, um, Jesus speak about the parable of the sower. Now, Fran did a very good job reading the parable. I'm not going to read it again, but I'm going to invite you to look at the framework. I don't know if uh, it can be put. Now, it would be difficult for you to see because it's far. But those who can, you have Theophilus' question. On the, on, on the left side, you have Theophilus' question. Left side column. Then you have the framework. You have the, the introduction to the parable. You have the parable and you have the interpretation. Now, on the row, on the, um, in color red, you have a mention of women. The black then you have the proclamation, the message. Purple, you have men, reference to men. Blue, you have the state of everything. And green, you have the allusion to the year of jubilee, the favorable of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the favorable year of the Lord, which happened once every 50 years. You could not miss it. Imagine your birthday happened twice a century. You cannot miss it. So what, looking, reading from that perspective, you would see that there is a commonality on the bottom. There is something that is being received. There is a transformation, but it doesn't stop at the transformation. People need, to be, people need to see. So if we take the women, Mary, Joanna, Susanna, were healed from every, a evil spirit and infirmity. What did they do? They, and many other, there's, there's, they, 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 they they provide to the ministry of Jesus with all what they have. Now, if you look at the parable, the good soil, or the, good, the seed who fall on the good soil, sprang up and bare fruit. And if you look at the interpretation, it's those who receive the word with an honest heart 
Keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, in verse 16, we are told that you cannot have something good and hide it. Because when something's good, you have something good, you put on the light and it shines. So the question that Luke wants us to answer here is, between the twelve and the women that were described at the introduction, who is the good soil? That's the question that Luke wants us to answer here. Between the twelve, the disciples, and those women, at this point of the time and ministry of Jesus, who is the good soil? According to that mapping, the women. And that's the question. Because Jesus, remember, in, in, in 736, asked a question. Who will, love, who will love the master the most? Here is, who have exemplified the characteristic of the kingdom of God from that perspective? It's obvious. It's obvious the women did. They have been like the year of Jubilee. Now, the question that we need to answer is, why did we miss the point? So, N.T. Wright argues that we have been trained to be Christians of the creeds, confession of faith. We have applied the epistle of Paul's as the gospel and neglected to restore the canonical gospel in their rightful places as the account of God's kingdom on earth. We develop dogma and statement of faith to determine who is in and who is out. The result is that we created congregation where article of faith supersede the writing of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the point that the, the idea of women in leadership of the church became solely based on what happened in Corinth. And in, that, in those type of environment, tradition is more important than the life and actions of Jesus. Now, this attitude is not unique to the church. Six months ago, I visited my family in Cameroon. And uh, the trip ended with the death of my niece. So what pained me the most was the fact that my sister were not allowed to see her child buried. You know why? Because she was a woman. In the tradition of, her, of my brother-in-law, which is a good man, women, stranger, and not initiated. Men cannot assist to a burial. Now, I saw my child come to the world, and I know what women go when it comes to child burial. Now, the idea of having a mother do not see, be, 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 be not allowed to see her child go to the ground, that's injustice. Why that? Because of traditions which supersede what the Lord may have said. My, 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 my sister is a Christian. Her, her husband, a Christian. Good people, but they have to live under that shadow. How blessed we are to live in Canada, where our grandmother, mother, wife, daughter, niece, granddaughter, do not have to go through those injustice, injustice. How blessed are we to worship here at EMC, where women have occupied all, fun, uh, occupied all function. Men can. Lead pastor, council chair, committee chairs, and so on. But the question is, are we off the hook? Can we do more? Now, months ago, I was speaking with Julie Dunster, 
our sound specialist about the challenges people face with sound equipment. Julie, is the time for me to switch mic. We, re we, we realize that here at EMC, we use microphones that were built with solely men in mind. I do not have, I do not have to think twice about the clothes that I need to wear to use those mics. But that is not the experience of our women here. They have to make a cautious decision. Otherwise, and it has happened, they will borrow their husband's belt. And I wish that, <laughs> I hope that the husband had the belt. But in this occasion, the husband had the belt, and the women could have proceed with using those. Now, the question is, what should we do? Should we ban this mic in our congregation? That's for the church to decide. But would it be awesome if a group of us take our pen and the paper right to the manufacturer in the name of Christ and say, can you build Mike, like that, so that our men and women can use that without thinking of the clothes they need to wear. So, doing it will lead us close to the conception of humanity, where God say, "Let us make make mankind in our image." in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. In response to the message that we have heard, I invite you to stand, if you are able, and turn in your voices together hymnal to song number 297, You Are Salt for the Earth. And look for the seed imagery in this song.
thank you, Emmanuel, for sharing and helping us to hear and see the parable from a different perspective and to hear God's word through that. You have come near to us and have shown us your patience, compassion, and love. As we go, O oh God, give us patience when people are indifferent to your word. Give us compassion for the needs of the world and give us love which reflects your forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <laughs>